Hi, hello, and welcome, or welcome back if you happen to watch me before, which by my small viewership, I am guessing that you have never seen me before, but hi, my name is Stacia, and we like to watch movies here, and um, that is what we're going to talk about, and since it is October, we are going to talk about spooky movies, and first, we are going to start with the classics from 1930s, some universal monster movies. So sit back, relax, and here we go. Now, the first movie of the classic universal horror movies that we'll be talking about is the 1931 movie, Dracula. One thing to remember about all of these movies is they came very soon after sound movies started. So in the 1920s up until the late 20s, everything was pretty much a silent film. And then late 20s and 30s, sound pictures started taking over. So there is a stark difference in sound styles than we're used to today. You'll notice a lot of these movies don't even have scores, which until you watch a movie with no score, it's amazing how jarring it is without a score or background music. The movie was of course directed by Todd Browning and starring Bela Lugosi as Dracula. Other stars of this movie are Helen Chandler as Mina, David Manor as John Harker, Dwight Fry as Renfield, and Edward Von Sloan as Dr. Helsing. And my dog, Max, as the one licking himself. And as I think everybody knows, this is based on the novel Dracula by Bram Stoker. It is about a vampire count named Dracula who travels from Transylvania to London and havoc ensues while he is in London claiming his victims and he becomes enchanted by Mina. And then it becomes a story of how to save Mina from Dracula's grasp with Dr. Van Helsing and John Harker leading the way to try to save her from Dracula's grasp before she becomes his ultimate victim. And then of course there's the crazy Renfield along the way as his lawyer as his loyal servant. I think Dracula is definitely a movie to watch for any movie fan or horror fan. It is great old movie history. Do I think it is the best of the Universal Monster movies? No, I don't. Like I said, it is stark in its sound design, being an early sound picture. It is weird to get used to there being no score and you don't know how much you miss a score until it's not there. It also, the pacing of it is not as good as let's say one of the other movies I'll be talking about Frankenstein, which came out the same year. And there is quite a difference between the design of Frankenstein and the design of Dracula. But is it a classic and worth watching? Yes, I do believe so. This does bring us to our next movie, which is indeed the 1931 classic Frankenstein. It is based on Mary Shelley's classic Frankenstein. It was written for the screen by John L. Balderston, I think, and it was directed by James Whale. It stars Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster, or the monster, Colin Clive as Henry Frankenstein, Mae Clark as Elizabeth, Dwight Fry as Fritz, Frederick Kerr as Baron Frankenstein, and Edward Von Sloan as Dr. Waldman. And as I said before, despite coming out in the same year as Dracula, which is 1931, it is in bold contrast to the look and feel of Dracula. And by this, I mean the sound design, the set design, the filming, the lighting, everything in Frankenstein seems a hundred times better. It seems like instead of being made in 1931, it was made like in the 
10 years following that, where you have to realize during that time in film, each year film made leaps and bounds over the years before. But I think most everybody is familiar with the story of Frankenstein. Dr. Henry Frankenstein is obsessed with being able to make his own living being. He basically robs graves and corpses to use body parts from others to make the being or the creature, which most people call it Frankenstein. It's really Frankenstein's monster. But that's a debate I think most people just call him Frankenstein, even though that refers to the doctor and not the monster. And as often in movies, when you try to take God's work into your own hands, trouble ensues and they're not able to control Frankenstein's monster and create a monster unleashed onto the community. And Frankenstein is by far my favorite of the universal classic monster movies. It just seems so much better done than the other movies. The story is better told. Like I said, it's better directed, it has better sound, it has better acting. Everything is ramped up in this movie. Not saying that I don't enjoy the other movies, but I do think this is the best of the best, probably followed by The Bride of Frankenstein, which is made by the same people, same director, same writer, same everything as this one. So it makes sense that in 1935, when The Bride of Frankenstein came along, that is just as good as this movie, but I would rank that second in line to Frankenstein, which The Bride of Frankenstein is really just a continuation of the story of Frankenstein, if you've ever read the novel. But like I said before, with Dracula, and really with all of these, they're not scary by today's movie standards, but for any classic movie fan, all of these movies are worth watching, and I think Frankenstein, out of all of them, holds up the best. Um, but if you are a movie buff, you will enjoy watching this movie. It is fun to delve deep into Hollywood history, and this is not even going back into the silent films, and see that always a wonderful story told wonderfully is always a good movie. So the next universal classic horror movie that we will be talking about is the 1932 classic, The Mummy, and no, this is not Brendan Fraser's Mummy. That movie is not that old. Again, the screenplay was written by John Balderston, like the Frankenstein screenplay was. And you have Boris Karloff playing Emiltep. And this time you have Carl Freud as the director. You have Zita Johan as Helen Grossfener, David Manners as Frank Wimple, Joseph Byron as Sir Arthur Wimple, Arthur Byron as Sir Joseph Wimple, and Edward von Sloan as Dr. Mueller. And the movie is about Egyptian mummy Emotep being resurrected and searching for his long lost love who he believes is his Egyptian princess. So he is on the search for her in Cairo and he believes that Helen is his long lost Egyptian princess. And of course this all happens after Joseph Wimple on an archeology span expedition in 1921 uncovers the tomb of Imhotep. There were lots of mummy movies made during the 30s and 40s and 50s, and this is the only one that doesn't have a correlation to any of those other movies. It is a different mummy in all of these movies. This is the one where it is Imhotep, and I believe the other monster movies, the mummy monster movies, it is a mummy named Karis that is on the rampage. And it is neat to note that this movie, Universal was inspired to make this movie because this is around the time where Tutankhamun's um, tomb was uncovered. And so the frenzy around that inspired Universal to make a mummy movie. This also helped cement making Boris Karloff the high echelon of 
movie monster gods. So in the previous year, he was, of course, Frankenstein, and now he is the mummy. And Universal used him as the chief promotion to get people to see those movies this movie because people loved him as Frankenstein. And yet again, is this movie scary? Not by today's standards, but could you imagine it being 19, in the 1930s, the early 30s watching these movies? There really wasn't, well, there was no Nosferatu. There were some horror movies before this, but you're still the sights and sounds of films to mass audience is, still new to people and what they're seeing and the effects used, although simple by today's standards, is very effective, especially to people that aren't so jaded or used to seeing it by this time. So it was a spectacle and a wonder for people to watch these movies. And again, like I said, these movies saved Universal Studios during this time. It was about to go bankrupt. So the next movie I have is 1933's The Invisible Man. Like Frankenstein, this was directed by James Whale. It is based on an H.G. Wells novel. And R.C. Sheriff is credited as the main writer of this movie. Claude Rains is your star of this movie. He plays Dr. Jack Griffith, also known as the Invisible Man. It also stars Gloria Stewart, who is known by most audiences of today as the old woman in the old or the older Rose in Titanic. So this is the story of Dr. Griffith, who develops a way to become completely invisible. And in becoming visible, he kind of goes mad and goes on a murderous killing spree. I would say besides the Frankenstein movies, and by Frankenstein movies, I just mean 1931's Frankenstein and 1935's Bride of Frankenstein, this is probably right under them in terms of quality. It is a great movie, a sci-fi e-horror movie where you're talking about being able to become invisible and, um, what that does to the psyche, it kind of gives you a God complex because you think you could do anything after that because you'll be undetected. And like I said, he goes mad and kills quite a few people in this movie. Um, it starts off with him trying to find a cure for being invisible because he made a formula where he could become visible but hadn't found out a way to bring himself back to visibility and then discovers, do I really want a cure for this? Because I have such power now. And for its time, the effects that they use in this movie are kind of amazing to watch. The things that you can actually do in on-camera effects, I mean, I think it goes without saying, there was no such thing as CGI at this time. All of this is done in camera of how they make his invisibility seem real. I also think this is quite a great representation of H.G. E. Wells' novel, The Invisible Man, if you have ever read that. And by this time, you will also notice that it's 1933 and they are bringing more music into the scores of the movie and relating the score of the movie to the importance of the storytelling. I still think today this is an endlessly watchable movie. Again, not scary, but from all these movies, you'll get those spooky fall vibes that you're looking for if you're wanting to ease yourself in to the horror of later years. And this does now bring me to the 1935 classic, The Bride of Frankenstein. As I have said before, this is probably my second favorite out of the universal classic horror monster movies. Um, and it is a direct sequel to the 1931 classic, Frankenstein. You still have Boris Karloff 
as Frankenstein and you have Colin Clive as Henry Frankenstein and there is Valerie Hobson as Elizabeth and my dog is drinking water now. In this movie you also have a prologue from Mary Shelley and Lord Byron and Mary Shelley's husband um, that introduces you to this movie. Basically this movie picks off picks up where the first movie left off after Frankenstein's monster has after Frankenstein's monster has they think perished in the flames Henry Frankenstein is on the mend from his wounds um, but this is the story of trying to make a companion for Frankenstein's monster so he will have somebody who truly loves and understands him. It's also about the hunt for Frankenstein to bring him to justice once they realize that he did not perish. Again, you have more sound elements introduced in this movie. You have more of a score. Um, the visuals are still stunning. Frankenstein looks a little bit different and he will actually speak this time. Um, and since uh, I believe Boris Karloff in the first one wore a mouth device and gave him a more sunken hollow look in the first one, this one, since he had to speak in the role, he was not able to wear that mouthing device. So Frankenstein looks a tad fuller faced in this one but I don't think that takes away from his appearance. They also added in elements if you remember from the first one where he burned from the fire so the makeup is a little bit different to include scarring on the head um, to really take up that fact that this is a direct continuation from the first movie. And this is again directed by James Whale is considered by some as one of the greatest horror movies of all time. Horror just in story, not the fact that it will scare you because unless you're a really little kid, as I have repeated oftentimes in this, none of these movies I think by today's standards are scary, but they are spooky and they do still tell an effective great story. And like I said, as long as you have good story writing and all the elements come together, I think movies hold up over time. And you just have to take an account to the technology they had back then. Just like today's movies in 20 years, of people thinking CGI looks really good, it'll look dated, trust me. And Elsa Lancaster in this movie plays a dual role. She plays Mary Shelley at the beginning, but she is also the bride of Frankenstein. And of course, this is the movie that introduces the iconic bride of Frankenstein with her tall hair with the white stripe that is, along with Frankenstein, a favorite Halloween costume even today. The last movie for our look into the classic universal horror movie pictures is a little bit newer than the rest of them. It is from 1941 and it is the movie The Wolfman. And I do encourage you to watch these movies in order because you will see that progress from 1931 to 1941 and the big difference those years make in sound design, set design, filming, and it all comes together in seeing this. It also makes other movies like Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and The Invisible Man stand out for their quality they had at the time that they were made. This was directed by George Wagner and written by Kurt Sidmark. It stars Claude Rains as Sir John Talbot, William Warren as Dr. Lloyd, Lon Chaney Jr. as Lawrence Talbot. It even has Bella Lugosi in it as the character of Bella. Lon Chaney Jr. is significant in the history of classic monster movies. His dad, Lon Chaney, was actually the Phantom in the Phantom of Opera in 1925. So he is carrying on a legacy 
of his family and his father playing monsters in these movies, although we didn't go that far back to the classic films, but just wanted to throw that in there that he actually is carrying on legacy of playing these types of, of roles. You also see the quality of makeup. If you're used to today's films, or <laughs> I say today's films, and I mean films like American Werewolf in London from the early 80s of that type of creature makeup. This is really the beginning of that. That and Frankenstein putting on these large prosthetic makeups and you have to appreciate in that time what they did with what they had to make the wolfman come to life. And this does play on the story of a gypsy woman meets Larry Talbot and she tells the story of the wolf that comes out during the full moon. He ends up getting bit and becomes a werewolf and from there the murderous ways take hold and it's on the hunt for this creature or proving his innocence as he has no memory of his actions when he is the werewolf. Lon Chaney Jr. also goes on to portray the Wolfman five times in films. And although this is the newest of the Universal monster movies, I do rank this as last in terms of what I like. Um, yes, you can see the progression of how far they've come in film at this point from 1931 to 1941 when this was made. But I think as storytelling goes, I do think the other movies are better than this. Just a little bit hold my interest a little bit more. But I do love a good Wolfman story. But my favorite uh, Wolfman story is probably American Werewolf in London. And I do have a place in my heart for the Mike Nichols um, movie Wolf. Um, as Jack with Jack Nicholson in the wolf role um, just because just because it is so campy and it's done that way on purpose if you ever watch that movie it's heightened over the top this is a direct tribute to these movies of this time but if you are a true film fan I do encourage you to watch these movies. I think it is important to get the history of movies. A lot of us get stuck in watching movies of our own time and don't look back into movies further. I just think, especially nowadays, a lot of especially younger people see a black and white movie and think, I possibly can't be entertained by this. And granted, I'll say a lot of people won't be, a lot of people won't get it. These movies are endlessly watchable and they aren't a big time commitment. These movies are all under an hour and 20 minutes and I think are really enjoyable. And you know in history where these movies come from, people still, still dress up as these characters. There are still stories being told about these characters as well. And I think there's nothing better than seeing where things came from. And so I encourage you to watch these movies. There are also a lot more universal horror movies than just these films. These are the main titles and I encourage you to seek out watching more of them and learning about your movie history. But thank you for watching. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of my few subscribers. I love you all. I would love to have more. And if you enjoyed this and if you enjoyed me, please like and subscribe and engage, get the conversation going. I would love to have more of a conversation with everybody about these films and see which movies you love and what you like. And maybe you have suggestions of more things I can check out. But please, if you will, subscribe. It would be great. But I'll see you next time and I love you all.